in danger. That year's grace has almost passed, and it follows an initial warning the year before that. And just last month, a draft decision released ahead of that June meeting, which is yet another warning, and perhaps it's the final warning that we will get after years of narrow escapes. And yet, when we look back over those almost three years, we see the Australian and Queensland governments have failed month after month to act on the World Heritage Committee's recommendations to save the reef. In fact, they've blocked their ears to this international concern from the UN's leading experts on environmental and cultural heritage and instead have directly contravened the committee's recommendations. We've seen the Abbott government approve more destructive development in Gladstone Harbour by ticking off on the final liquefied natural gas plant on World Heritage listed Curtis Island, the Arrow LNG plant. The Abbott government also approved what would be the world's largest coal port at Abbott Point near the Whitsundays, allowing three million cubic metres of dredge spoil to be dumped into the reef's World Heritage waters. The science shows that the dredge sludge won't just stay put where it's dumped. It can spread many kilometres to smother corals and seagrass beds, breeding grounds for turtles and dugongs, and feeding grounds. The Abbott government's tick-off came despite internal findings within the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority that dumping all of that sludge into the reef's waters would create significant and irreparable damage. Now, those findings were only exposed publicly as a result of a Freedom of Information request. And after they came to light, the Senate supported a Greens motion calling on Environment Minister Hunt to revoke his approval of the Abbott Point coal port. The documents released under FOI put a lie to the minister's claims that the dumping of millions of tonnes of sludge into this delicate World Heritage area would be able to be offset, compensated for, and in fact would somehow actually improve water quality by 150 per cent. Now, whether the minister knew about those internal uh, warnings of the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park scientists is still a mystery because the government has still not revealed um, the documents that the Greens sought through an order for production of documents. If the minister didn't see those internal scientific warnings, then he should now reconsider that approval for Abbott Point and revoke it. If the minister did know about those documents and yet ignored the science that said that the reef damage could not be offset, it shows that he is unfit to be the environment minister. Minister Hunt claims that the damage of dumping three million cubic metres of dredge spoil can be offset, and that's simply ludicrous. Over five years, with $200 million of funding and with the cooperation of two levels of government, Queensland and the Commonwealth, we've managed to avert one twentieth of the sediment that Minister Hunt has now approved to be dumped offshore to make Abbott Point the world's largest coal port, undermining, of course, the good work that those farmers have done to avert that sediment. Somehow, the uh, coal miners and the Ports Corp can be 20 times more efficient than two levels of government over five years with $200 million. Now, we know that dredging and dumping creates far more damage than could ever be feasibly offset because we've seen it all happen before at Gladstone Harbour. The shores of Gladstone Harbour were littered with fish kills, diseases and dolphin and dugong carcasses following the dredging and dumping program there. A report into the Gladstone Harbour disaster that Minister Hunt himself uh, commissioned last week found poor environmental management contributed to that. It found that compliance monitoring was inadequate, that records weren't kept and that multiple complaints about alleged breaches of environmental conditions, those stringent environmental conditions that the government always champions, multiple complaints about those breaches weren't even followed up. The report clearly and uh, thankfully recommended an increase in compliance monitoring. But despite this, the Abbott government's budget cuts compliance and enforcement staff at the Environment Department and cuts funding for the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park Authority. These cuts are leaving the door wide open for the disaster at Gladstone to be repeated throughout the reef. The environmental destruction at Gladstone was so severe that it was what first prompted the World Heritage Committee to visit the reef and to develop those recommendations to stop the disaster at Gladstone being repeated elsewhere in the reef. Now, those recommendations included pressing pause on new development while a long-term plan for the reef was completed. Sadly, the pause was not pressed. 
Those recommendations included no new ports in pristine areas and no port expansions that would damage the overall universal value of the reef. And yet, the Newman and Abbott governments have continued to approve mega industrial ports alongside the reef, including that what would become that world's largest coal port at Abbott Point. Now, this blatant disregard for the World Heritage Committee's recommendations has led the committee to uh, release a draft decision just last month, uh, confirming that the reef's world heritage status is still in jeopardy um, at the upcoming meeting uh, in just over a month. Now, a world heritage in danger listing for the Great Barrier Reef would devastate the $5 billion a year tourism industry, which employs 63,000 people, and it would go down in history as an environmental tragedy. How would we be able to explain to our grandchildren that in 2014, with full knowledge, the Australian and Queensland governments let our precious reef end up on the world heritage list of sites in danger? An in danger listing would show the world that our governments are putting the interests of big mining companies ahead of their stewardship of this international icon and putting its future in doubt. I can't bear to think of my daughter and future grandchildren not being able to, to visit and appreciate this incredible natural wonder as I did as a child. I saw that raw beauty and that colourful complexity and felt that awe, which I would like everyone to be able to experience. For Mother's Day this year, my now five-year-old gave me a lump of plasticine, which she said was a coral bommie to help me save the reef. My darling girl, I will keep trying. And like so many Australians, I'm committed to protecting that icon, to being able to sit with my future grandchildren and talk of the old days where the world was dominated by coal and gas interests and tell them the great story of what we did as a community to win, what we did to fight and win for what we hold precious and how we did, in fact, save the reef. A similar story has been told in the past, most compellingly by Judith Wright, who famously led a strong community campaign in the 70s to save the reef from limestone mining and oil drilling. In her book, Coral Battleground, Judith Wright wrote, as the battle for the reef progressed, all of us who were fighting to keep those crystal waters from sacrilege became welded in a very deep companionship, and that in itself helped to keep us at work. And today, I can feel that same community spirit in our generation's fight to save the reef from the disregard and the destruction of the big mining companies. Across the country, thousands of Australians ra rallied together at community events against the Abbott government's abhorrent approval of the world's largest coal port in this World Heritage Area at Abbott Point. Hundreds of thousands of dollars have been donated to fund community court cases against that Abbott Point approval. Newspapers have been flooded with countless letters to the editor expressing disgust over the Abbott government's treatment of our precious reef. Countless Australians have shown their support for the reef through social media and by signing petitions. The fishing industry, tourism operators, community groups and environmentalists have formed strong alliances with the shared goal of protecting our precious reef and the 63,000 jobs it provides. We even have ice cream on our side, with Ben and Jerry's getting behind the cause and giving out free ice creams to raise awareness of the big mining company's threat to the reef, much to the annoyance of the Queensland government and uh, Senator Boswell's annoyance as well, I can note. Um, there's a strong, vibrant, passionate and growing community movement that's standing up for the reef, and the Greens are proud to be standing alongside it, while sadly the old parties are in bed with the big mining companies. Together we're a force to be reckoned with. Millions of Australians love the Great Barrier Reef, and together we can protect it from becoming a dumping ground for dredge spoil and a shipping superhighway for the big mining companies to burn the fossil fuels that are cooking this planet and the reef itself. And what's more, in a sign of the madness of the Abbott and Newman government's coal at all costs is actually helping the cause. The coal price keeps on dropping as more and more countries embrace renewable technology to power their lives sustainably. And this means that the mega coal mines of the Galilee Basin are not only environmentally disastrous, but economically risky as well. BHP, Rio Tinto, Anglo-American Coal and Lendlease have all pulled out of Abbott Point Coal Terminal, following a low, a low global coal demand, uh, scientific concern and community pressure. 
Glencore Extrata scrapped its plans for a coal port at Balaclava Island in the Southern Reef, and Mitchell Group just last week dropped their plans also for the pristine uh, Fitzroy Delta. Those big names are pulling out, and it's a clear sign that the world doesn't want our climate-destroying coal. And yet even this hasn't stopped the Abbott and Newman governments ticking off on mega coal mines in the Galilee Basin. These mines would be a climate disaster. They would see more than 100 million tonnes of coal exported through the Great Barrier Reef every year, dramatically increasing Australia's contribution to global climate change, which of course would worsen the plight of the reef further still. In fact, if the Galilee Basin was a country and all of its coal was burnt, it would be the seventh largest emitter of carbon dioxide in the world. There's really uh, so much at stake in our fight to save the reef. It extends to the health of our climate globally and to Queensland's land and water under threat from those Galilee mega coal mines and, of course, the 30 to 40,000 coal seam gas wells planned um, for some of our best food producing land. Our campaign also represents the growing frustration that so many Australians feel and it was uh, sadly proven again last night that the interests of big business and the mining companies are continually being put first by governments that are supposed to represent citizens, not their corporate donors. Our fight to save the Great Barrier Reef is a rallying point for everyone with a shared understanding that the profits of foreign-owned coal and gas companies are a poor trade for the irreparable destruction of something so precious and unique that it is integral to our national identity one of the seven natural wonders of the world, no less. In Judith Wright's words, the reef's fate is a microcosm of the new battle within ourselves. So this is not just a story of one campaign. The human attitudes, the social and industrial forces, and the people who in one way or another take part in the campaign represent a much wider field and one in which the future of the human race may be finally decided. Thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President.